Hi, this is Dr. Paul Shin, and uh, I'm going to review the topic of image-guided catheter insertion uh, to treat pneumothorax or pleural effusion. And uh, I'm going to share my screen with you, and uh, we'll get started. So we're going to review the technique of uh, uh, CT-guided pleural catheter insertion. Uh, you know, for uh, pleural effusions, we often use ultrasound also, but for pneumothorax, uh, many times this is following a CT-guided lung biopsy, and uh, we often use CT for pneumothorax uh, catheter drainage placements. We're going to review the use of uh, a dry suction and water seal chest drainage system, uh, and we'll kind of go through the principles of that and some user tips. Uh, we'll talk about catheter management post-procedure tasks, uh, looking for air leaks, how to remove the catheter, and things like that. So first of all, if you have a patient with an acute tension pneumothorax, you may have to very urgently place a catheter into the chest. And if, if, uh, if it's more convenient, you can just immediately insert a five French one-step centesis catheter uh, into the uh, pneumothorax, and the pressure of the pneumothorax will force air out of the pleural cavity. Uh, and you can do that as a temporizing measure. You can then, if you want to attach a uh, uh, 60 mil, 60 mil lower lock syringe with a three-way stopcock to manually evacuate air, or uh, even easier, just attach a Heimlich valve or a pneumostat device with a vinyl connecting tube. Uh, but uh, if, if you have an acute tension pneumothorax, you may have to act very quickly. Now the decision on whether or not to place a chest tube uh, for pneumothorax uh, is largely driven by symptoms. If the patient is asymptomatic, we often don't uh, put in a chest tube, but if it's a moderate to large pneumothorax, we, we often will at least try to aspirate the pneumothorax or put in a pleural catheter. Uh, if the patient has borderline respiratory status for any reason, you should have a lower threshold for putting in a, a chest tube. Same thing, you know, severe emphysema uh, where, where the, the, you know, compromised respirations is a real issue. Uh, you should have a low threshold to put in a chest tube. And if you attempt to aspirate a pneumothorax uh, after a lung biopsy and it recurs, you're generally going to want to put in a chest tube in that situation. Um, the thing to realize is that placing pleural catheters is very safe, very easy, very, uh, very quick, and it's really part of doing lung biopsies. And uh, uh, it's, it's almost expected, especially in high-risk patients, that you may have to put in a chest tube. So don't be afraid of, of having to put in a chest tube. And uh, having a low threshold for placing the chest tube may uh, be in the patient's best interest. This is a vinyl connecting tube, which is a handy device to connect your drainage catheter to any of the uh, devices that we're gonna talk about uh, to, to evacuate the air. Uh, there are many different catheters you can use. This is just one example. And uh, uh, I tend to like using 14 French catheters for uh, any type of chest drainage, whether it's pleural effusion or pneumothorax, because it's resistant to kinking and you're less likely to have uh, problems with the catheter either becoming clogged or kinked. Uh, a 25 centimeter length is pretty ideal for most chest tubes. Uh, it's not too long, uh, but if you need to, you can use a longer catheter. Uh, this is just a tray setup. You know, you'll need a number 11 scalpel, you'll need the catheter, a bowl of saline, your prep sticks, uh, some uh, needle, uh, needle driver or uh, tissue spreaders, and uh, and then of course the dressing, and you'll need your vinyl connecting tube. So get everything ready in advance, um, and if you're going to attach uh, a chest drainage system, uh, for example, we, we use the atrium oasis here, have it ready and set up, uh, set up ready to go, um, and then you can uh, also have Alternatively, the vinyl connecting tube and either a Heimlich valve or a pneumostat device. These are both essentially one-way one valve devices uh, that are very uh, light and portable and are great for patients so that they can ambulate if they have a small air leak. Um, 
you can keep a 10 mil Lurlock syringe handy, and that way once you get the chest catheter in, you can just close off the uh, catheter with a Lurlock syringe until you're ready to hook up to the uh, drainage device. Ideal catheter attributes, uh, you know, you'd like to select a catheter that's very easy to trocar, that has a nicely tapered tip, uh, that has a hydrophilic coating, and that can be placed either using trocar or modified Selvinger technique. Uh, a catheter stiffness that resists buckling is really nice. Uh, and if it has graduated markings uh, for depth, uh, it's just a helpful feature. And then uh, you, it's better to have a catheter where the locking thread uh, does not exit through the hub end opening uh, because then you have to cut it before you can uh, attach a device. So that, uh, uh, otherwise you may have an air leak at the lower lock connection. And um, we, get, we usually use catheters with a locking loop because it decreases the risk of the catheter inadvertently being retracted out of the pleural space into the chest wall. Um, and you can use the same type of catheter for both pleural fluid drainage or pneumothorax drainage. Uh, when you first set up, you're going to straighten out the loop of the catheter. And this particular catheter has a plastic sheath that pulls over the loop to keep it straight for you. Then you'll advance the metal stiffener or cannula into the uh, end of the catheter and lock it with the lure lock uh, hub. And then you'll uh, push in the sharp metal stylet and lock that in place so that you're ready to trocar. Uh, remove the slack in the thread by pulling on the thread at the hub. And notice that for most catheters, uh, the loop itself will use about nine to 10 centimeters of the distal end of the catheter. That means that you're gonna to have to have the catheter at least uh, 10 centimeters into the pleural space, uh, uh, which might be more than you expected. So we love to use this technique of pre-bending the catheter to create a, a curved catheter. You can actually bend it slightly more than this so that it's a 90 degree gradual curve. You'll basically uh, put many small bends in the catheter from about the last side hole all the way to the hub to create this 90 degree curve. We describe this technique in uh, a publication in abdominal radiology. And it's, it's great not only for chest tube placement, for, but for any catheter drainage using CT fluoro where you uh, uh, would like to avoid Seldinger technique. The insertion site for pleural catheters, especially for pneumothorax, uh, is usually in the first interspace anteriorly. Uh, so that means just above the second rib anteriorly. Uh, you want to stay lateral to the internal mammary vessels, of course. Uh, and in terms of where you uh, make your incision, usually you're going to make the skin incision just uh, either over the top of the second rib below or even over the rib. Uh, I'll sometimes make it right over the middle, mid portion of the uh, second rib so that I'm angling slightly cephalad as I enter the pleural space in the lower intercostal space above that rib. And the reason for that is I want the catheter to preferentially move superiorly when it gets into the pleural space. And also when the lung re-expands, it will be, uh, if, if the catheter angles a little bit into the pleural space, it'll be a little bit less likely to kink. Always avoid the subclavian uh, vessels as well. Uh, in most patients, if you're going into the first interspace, they, they will be out of the way, but occasionally you'll encounter a patient whose subclavian vessels uh, come down a little bit lower, especially if they're very kyphotic. So when the patient is supine, you can get a planning CT with a grid if you want to and uh, localize the entry point. Uh, you want to be, again, coming over that uh, lower rib and angling slightly cephalite into the inner space. Uh, this slice is a little bit high, so here we are a little bit lower and uh, we're going to uh, advance the catheter lateral to the internal mammary vessels into this uh, inner space just above that second rib. And when we do our local anesthesia, we place the local needle all the way right onto the pleura so that we really numb up the pleura and then uh, numb up the entire track on the way out. And notice we're staying close to the top of the second rib. 
Uh, once you make your skin incision, make it big enough for the catheter, use tissue spreaders to loosen the subcutaneous tissues. And then uh, you'll dip the catheter tip in saline to activate the hydrophilic coating. Put the catheter tip into the incision site and notice that because you pre-bent the catheter and are using this curved trocar technique, you can uh, keep your hand well out of the CT beam. And now we'll move the patient into the scanner. And when you take a CT fluoro image, you can see exactly where your catheter is directed and pointed. Um, and then you can incrementally advance the catheter uh, into the pleural space. So what, the, what we do is we hold the hub of the catheter, the very end of the hub, so that your hand is away from the, uh, the beam. And you can rest your arm against the patient's body so that your uh, arm is completely stable and you don't even have to look at the catheter. You can look at the CT fluoro monitor to check your angle and confirm uh, the trajectory. And, uh, and so if you pull the catheter uh, hub towards the patient's feet, it's going to point towards the head. If you move the catheter hub in towards the gantry, it's going to point towards the feet. And of course, you can point right or left, uh, whichever uh, direction you need. When you're ready to advance the catheter, grab it close to the skin. Sometimes it helps to use gauze because the catheter might be a little bit slippery. And by holding it very close to the skin, you can use a lot of force to advance the catheter through tougher tissues in small increments. It's very safe because you can't go too deep in one motion. If you, if you grab the catheter six centimeters from the skin, there's a risk that you might plunge the catheter in further than you want to. So grab it close to the skin and that allows you to push hard, but you won't go too deep. So here we've, uh, we're using inter in incremental uh, CT fluoro, monitoring the catheter. The tip is now very close to the pleura, ideal position going just over the second rib. And we grab the catheter close to the skin and push it into the pleural space. Because this is a large pneumothorax, we pushed it, pushed it in further than it really has to go. But notice that you do want to have not only the metal stylet tip in the pleural space, but about five to 10 millimeters of the, pl of the plastic catheter should be in the pleural space. And the reason for that is it, uh, you wanna make sure the catheter deploys into the pleural space and not into the extra pleural space. Once the catheter is in the pleural space, you're going to push it off of the metal cannula or stiffener uh, into the chest cavity. So the first thing to do is to uh, release the catheter from the, the hubs of the metal stiffener and stylet. Uh, realize that the metal is bent, so the, the, the plastic hubs connected to the metal cannula and stylet will not want to turn easily, whereas the catheter will uh, turn easily. So you can rotate the catheter hub to release it from the, the uh, stiffener. And then you're going to use, um, uh, let's see, so here we're just showing the catheter uh, deployed into the pleural space. Don't pull the metal stiffener back into the body wall, or at least keep the, the tip of the metal stiffener at the level of the pleural, uh, the parietal pleura. You want that support in the chest wall so you don't inadvertently buckle the catheter in the chest wall. Now, when you're ready to deploy the catheter, you've released the catheter from the hub there of the, of the stiffener. So you're gonna advance the catheter really with both hands. So if you look at this picture, your left hand in this case, uh, your index finger is gonna be pushing the catheter off of the hub of the metal stiffener. So you're holding the metal stiffener with, with your thumb and uh, uh, third and fourth fingers while you're using your index finger to push the catheter off of the metal stiffener. And then, with your right hand at the patient's skin, you're kind of guiding the catheter into the patient's body. And if you just keep your eye on the curve of the catheter, just try to maintain that curve as you uh, advance the catheter, slide it off the metal cannula. Uh, because if you maintain that curve, the metal will not be going further inside the patient's body. So think if you think about that for a minute, if you're holding the the hub of the metal cannula and stiffener, or, or the metal stiffener and stylet with your left hand, 
and you're advancing the catheter, as long as that curve is maintained, the metal will not go deeper in. But if the curve flattens, then the metal is pushing in a little bit further than, uh, than it is currently positioned. So uh, keep that in mind. Okay, so here the catheter has been uh, pushed into the pleural space. The loop has been formed. It's in good position. Uh, notice that we're, we chose this inner space because we like the, the catheter for a pneumothorax to be in the upper anterior pleural uh, cavity. That's where air tends to be when a patient is either upright or supine, and that facilitates uh, drainage of the pneumothorax uh, by, by putting it up in this location. Notice that if you create a lot of redundancy of the catheter in the upper chest, it will tend to drop into the lower chest by gravity. So that kind of defeats the purpose. You can put the catheter up in the apical region above the second rib, but if you, if you advance the catheter way into the pleural space, it will just drop into the lower chest. So you want the catheter loop to be fully inside the pleural space, uh, but with only a little bit of extra tubing, maybe one or two centimeters, so that it doesn't drop into the lower chest. All the side holes have to be into, in the pleural space. Otherwise, if you have any side holes in the chest wall, you'll be get, uh, at risk for getting uh, uh, significant soft tissue emphysema. So here we've attached the catheter to either a chest drainage system or a Heimlich valve or uh, pneumostat device, and this has evacuated the uh, air. In this case, we're also draining pleural fluid, so uh, the catheter can be positioned a little bit more posteriorly. Here it's kind of on the side, and that's allowing for drainage of both fluid and air. So again, optimal positioning, make sure all the side holes are in the pleural space. That means you have to advance the catheter about 12 centimeters uh, into the pleural space, because remember, nine to 10 centimeters forms the loop. And then uh, you, can, you can see the side holes of the catheter by using bone windows, by the way. And then again, target the upper apical region anteriorly and don't use too much length of catheter so it doesn't drop into the lower chest. Uh, if you have a lot of fluid in addition to a pneumothorax, sometimes it may be helpful to put a, an additional tube posteriorly in the lower chest, but uh, not always necessary. And then of course, if you have a loculated pleural collection, uh, that limits your approach and you'll have to uh, place the catheter wherever the loculation is. Once the catheter is in place and you've taken out the metal stiffener and stylet, pull on the thread to form the loop, wrap the thread around the groove and snap the uh, ring in place and then you can break off the tab. Um, some people don't like to use stopcocks for chest tubes because they're afraid that somebody will close the stopcock but I like to use a two-way stopcock uh, because when it comes time to do the clamping trial, I prefer to close a stopcock rather than clamping our uh, 14 French catheters. 14 French catheters are much smaller and more delicate than the chest tubes placed by the thoracic surgeons. And so these can be damaged by a clamp. And so that's why I use the stopcock. But in order to avoid inadvertent uh, uh, closure of the stopcock by someone on the floor, I create sort of a, uh, 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 a mechanism that prevents inadvertent uh, closing of the stopcock. I use a long strip of silk tape, two inch wide silk tape, and I pull about, oh, maybe 12 inches, so about a foot, or maybe, uh, maybe 10 to 12 inches of uh, silk tape. I fold over both ends to create tabs, and then I place the catheter with the stopcock open on one half of the uh, silk tape. And then I fold over the silk tape and press it around the stopcock uh, to sort of uh, uh, keep the stopcock locked open. Before you do this, make sure all your connections are snug, not overly tightened, but very snug so that there's no air leak at the connections and then put your silk tape on. And the silk tape tabs allow you to easily remove the silk tape when it's time to do the clamping trial. Okay, so what's gonna facilitate rapid sealing of an air leak? Uh, and one of the best uh, uh, conditions is when you have pleural apposition at the puncture site. 
So for example, if you did a lung biopsy from a posterior approach and that's where the, the puncture is, that, you know, that's kind of ideal because we usually put the chest tube anterior and the patient tends to lay supine. And so the lung will drop posteriorly, you'll get pleural apposition, it will tend to uh, allow the pleural puncture site to seal quickly, and the chest tube is anteriorly removing any air that does leak out. Um, obviously, if, if the, you have a large visceral pleural puncture, uh, either because the patient had underlying emphysema or there was something about the way you did the puncture, you torqued the needle or something, then uh, that will make the leak tend to last longer and be harder to uh, seal. Um, and if you have a subpleural consolidation at the puncture site, so in a way, if you, if you do a lung biopsy and you happen to get a little bit of hemorrhage right up against the pleural puncture site, that can be helpful in preventing the pneumothorax. You can even do an intentional blood patch. There's even a commercial plug available, although that has its pros and cons. And uh, so these can, may help uh, uh, reduce the risk of a uh, pneumothorax. Or, or, or facilitate rapid sealing of the uh, air leak. Um, if you consider the patient positioning, uh, I'd like to kind of position the patient in the post-procedure uh, period to favor pleural apposition. So if it's a posterior puncture supine, if it's a lateral puncture decubitus with the puncture side down, if you came anteriorly, prone positioning is not always feasible, but sometimes it is, and that can definitely help seal even an anterior puncture. So, so what are some clues that the catheter is appropriately positioned in the pleural space? So as soon as you put the catheter in and attach, for example, a Heimlich valve, you may see fluttering of the valve when the patient coughs or breathes. That tells you that the catheter loop is in the pleural space. If you've hooked up a chest drainage system like the atrium oasis, you can look for fluctuating uh, motion of the float ball in the water seal chamber if the patient's on water seal, uh, or you can look for bubbling in the air leak monitor chamber uh, uh, if the patient is on either water seal or wall suction, that indicates that air is coming out of the chest unless there's a, a leaky connection. If you're using a pneumostat, you can put one milliliter of water in the side well as long as you're holding the pneumostat upright and you can look for bubbling that indicates air is exiting the pleural space. I'll show you that in a minute. So what are some potential problems? If you have a patient with a very thick or tough chest wall, it may be a little bit challenging to trocar in the catheter. Although I find that with experience, it's, it's, it's uh, quite uncommon uh, that you're not able to trocar in a catheter into the upper anterior chest. Uh, but it does happen, in which case you can use Seldinger technique, uh, use dilators, but just be careful not to injure the lung with the guide wire or the dilators. Only insert the soft, flexible portion of the guide wire into the pleural space. Keep the rigid portion in the chest wall. Don't advance the dilators further than necessary into the pleural space. And be especially careful if you know the patient has diseased lung that may, may be more friable. Um, the catheter can deploy inadvertently into the extra pleural space. And uh, uh, if, if you see the catheter sort of hugging the uh, chest cavity near at the insertion site, that's a pretty good indication that it's actually extra pleural and just bulging the pleura. And it may look like it's uh, in the pleural space, but if it's hugging that, that the chest wall, and not dropping freely into the pneumothorax or pleural fluid, then you probably are extra pleural. So if that happens, remove the catheter, uh, reinsert the, the metal stiffener and stylet, and, and, uh, and then start over. Uh, if, uh, if the catheter um, uh, is inadvertently pushed uh, into the lung, uh, just pull it back into the pleural space and then deploy it into the pleural space. Usually you'll get away with this. Uh, you know, it can cause a little bit of uh, bleeding in the lung. It can cause a, a pneumothorax, uh, but usually uh, it's, uh, the lung is pretty forgiving in this regard. And if you just pull the catheter tip back into the pleural space and deploy it, 
uh, the, the lung tends to heal pretty quickly. Okay, so if you have a patient, again, who has a tension pneumothorax and is acutely short of breath, uh, we already talked about quickly getting in any catheter, even a centesis catheter. If the catheter buckles in the chest wall, that usually occurs because you pulled the metal, metal stiffener back too far before advancing the catheter. So keep the stiffener all the way to the pleura until you're finished advancing the catheter. If you have a very small pneumothorax, uh, uh, number one, ask yourself, do you need a chest tube? But if you do, you can either do a modified Selinger technique and, and an oblique approach so that the guide wire and dilators are not pointed directly at the lung. Uh, or you can try trocarine uh, in an oblique trajectory also. This is one of the reasons I don't like smaller uh, diameter catheters like a 10 French or 8 French catheter is they're very susceptible to kinking and uh, they also clot easily if there's any blood in the pleural space. Uh, so uh, number one, angle slightly towards the head as you insert the catheter so that the catheter lays uh, uh, in, in the pleural space without kinking. Keep in mind when the lung re-expands, it pushes the catheter against the, the parietal pleura. And if it's entering the chest cavity in a perpendicular direction, it's more likely to kink than if it comes in sort of more obliquely. The catheter can also kink on the stay fix device. And so make sure that the stay fix device is positioned so that the catheter lays without kinking uh, in the, uh, the, the little hump on the uh, stay fix device. Um, I, once I do secure the catheter with a fixation device, I usually add an additional one inch silk tape uh, that's I kind of uh, apply similarly to the way we secure nasogastric tubes so that it's just an additional anchor preventing the tube from being pulled back and then cover everything with a tegaderm dressing. Uh, I also tape the tubing to the body wall to prevent accidental dislodgement. Uh, you can tape the Heimlich valve or pneumostat to the sternal region or it has a clip that will attach to the gown. Make sure that the connections are airtight but not overly tightened and uh, because these can be a source of false positive air leaks as we'll talk about in a minute. This is the vinyl connecting tube connecting the uh, lower lock uh, at the catheter hub with the chest drainage system. Uh, same, it also attaches to the pneumostat. So again, we can either use a chest drain system, uh, common uh, vendors are Atrium Oasis or Pleurovac, and then the Atrium Pneumostat is essentially a Heimlich valve with a reservoir. So for the chest drainage system, this is the concept. Uh, so uh, it's, you can think of two, three jars in a row. They're all connected by tubing. And uh, if we start from the wall suction, the wall suction regulator controls the suction pressure, at least the maximum suction pressure, uh, from the wall, and that goes into this first container. And uh, notice that there's another uh, tube that's in the air that goes to the next jar. So air that comes from the uh, water seal jar goes into the suction control jar and out, out of that jar to the wall. Uh, but there's a middle tube that goes down into the water. And the higher the level of the water, uh, the the higher the maximum uh, suction pressure is. And the reason that is, is that uh, uh, air that is sucked in through the top of that jar, through that middle tube, has to overcome the column of water in the jar to bubble out into the, uh, the air above. And uh, so this column of water is sort of the safety valve. It prevents uh, suction from exceeding the, the, the height of the water column. So that's sort of the, the suction control jar. The middle jar is the water seal and it simply prevents backflow of uh, uh, air into the chest. Uh, you can see that the tube that's closer to the chest is underwater and so air cannot go back into that tube, only water can be pulled back and, and it would have to overcome that column uh, of pressure to uh, get pulled back into the chest. 
And then the first jar is the drainage collection jar. So any fluid or air that comes out of the uh, patient goes into this jar. The fluid drops to the bottom of the collection jar. The air just goes from jar to jar until it exits. And so that's the basic uh, concept of the chest drainage systems. And there are different vendors. This is uh, one that we're using right now. Uh, and it, uh, it's important that these things sit upright to work properly. And uh, when you set it up, our nurses will usually set it up for us. Uh, but what they'll do is they'll add 45 mils of sterile fluid that comes with the kit into the top of this um, uh, suction port. And then that drops into the bottom of the uh, air leak monitor chamber. And so it should be filled to about the two centimeter fill line in that chamber. And then uh, we, if we take a closer look at the device, on the top left, there's a regulator that uh, uh, sets the maximum suction pressure. So minus 20 is where it's set right now. So the pres pressure will not get, uh, uh, the suction will not go to minus 30. It, it will not go, uh, be any greater than minus 20. Below that is what's called the wall suction indicator. When it's all the way to the the left uh, where it is now that's telling you that there's no suction. When you hook it up to wall suction, you need sufficient wall suction that it pulls that orange bellows all the way to the arrowhead or beyond. And that tells you that you have sufficient uh, wall suction. And again, the maximum pressure is controlled by the regulators, so that will prevent you from applying too much suction. And then uh, the water seal chamber is where uh, there's a float ball that sits on top of the water within this uh, water seal chamber. It goes up and down. And uh, the, uh, the numbers, the graduated numbers, are basically telling you what the, uh, the pressure is in the pleural space. So if the patient inhales, uh, it's uh, going to uh, pull the, the, the fluid and the float ball up within this chamber. And so the, uh, the, the, the upper numbers are negative. So like uh, as it goes up 5, 10, minus 15, minus 20, it's, it's the centimeters of water, minus uh, 10, 15, 20 centimeters of water when the patient inhales. And then when they exhale, it's pushing air uh, through the device into the air leak monitor chamber and it pushes the float ball down so the pressure gets positive. Uh, as you can see, uh, plus one, plus two. Okay, so we've set the regulator. Uh, we uh, talked about the water seal chamber, and this is the uh, um, pleural manometry, uh, where, again, you can see the float ball going up and down, and it basic, basically is showing you what the pleural pressure is doing. Uh, when it goes up, it's negative. When it goes down, it's positive. And then uh, the, if you want to calculate what the pleural pressure is, you simply add the, uh, the suction regulator setting to the pressure in the uh, uh, float ball uh, water seal chamber. So if this regulator is set to minus 20 and the float ball is up at minus 5, then the pleural pressure is minus 25 centimeters of, uh, of water. And then uh, if there is an air leak and air is bubbling through the chamber, uh, that, that tells you air is coming out of the chest. Uh, if you first put the catheter in, air is going to be coming out just because there's the pneumothorax. But once the pneumothorax is evacuated, if you still see air bubbling, uh, that means there's an ongoing air leak. And... Uh, and how far the bubbles pull across the, uh, the uh, uh, air leak chamber is an indicator of how big the air leak is. I'll, I think I have another slide to show you that. Okay, so uh, again, the regulator is set. So the air leak monitoring chamber, the severity of the air leak is sort of graded from one to five based on how far the bubbles travel uh, to the left here. So if they go all the way to the number five, that uh, tells you it's a big air leak. If they only go to one or two, it's a smaller air leak. Remember, always it needs to be positioned upright. 
There are hooks that will attach to the rails of the patient bed, and there's feet that will keep it uh, standing upright on the uh, floor. Uh, again, adequate wall suction is present when the orange bellows goes at least to the arrow or further. And uh, so this is the old classic Heimlich valve. So the blue end is attached to the chest tube. And if you look in the chamber, you can see there's this clear plastic uh, flat tubing. And because it's flat like that, it will not alert, allow air to enter retrograde into the chest cavity, but air can easily open that uh, flat tubing and exit through the other end. And uh, so if you see that uh, flat tubing within the, the cylinder there fluttering, that tells you air is going, is exiting the chest. The pneumostat is something that we now use pretty much routinely instead of the Heimlich valve. And the only reason is that it has a convenient uh, 30 mil reservoir. So it, it's also a one-way valve system. It's very lightweight. It's great to allow the patient to ambulate, but it also collects small amounts of fluid, which often come out, even, even if you're just treating a pneumothorax, sometimes a little bit of pleural fluid exits, and this collects that fluid. It's easy to drain it. You just attach a Luralox syringe to the bottom and aspirate out the fluid. Okay, so uh, when do you use a Heimlich valve versus a chest drain system with wall suction? Well, for small air leaks, I almost always prefer the Heimlich valve or the pneumostat. And um, the reason is you're, just, you're not gonna wanna apply suction if it's a very small air leak. Uh, you know, using uh, active wall suction can sometimes uh, act to pull air out of the lung puncture site and really can keep a, a, a leak active longer, preventing it from sealing. So a rule of thumb is avoid wall suction when you don't need it. And if you do need wall suction, use as little as, you, as, little as possible to keep the, the lung expanded. So, uh, you know, the other thing is if you are developing soft tissue, if the patient is developing soft tissue emphysema, that may mean that you need more suction. And so that's an indication for using a chest drain system with wall suction. Okay, so for large air leaks that might occur either because it was a large puncture or if the patient has emphysema, uh, in th these cases, it's often better to use a chest drain system and then you can adjust the amount of wall suction. Again, keep it as low as possible, uh, but uh, uh, it, will, it will prevent you from getting a lot of soft tissue emphysema or not uh, re-expanding the lung. And then if there is also a lot of pleural fluid, it's, it's much more convenient to have the patient hooked up to a chest drain system because it will collect both the fluid and the air. Uh, it, it, it can handle a lot of fluid uh, whereas the other systems can only handle minimal fluid. Uh, a chest drain system, when it's placed on water seal, in other words, it's not hooked up to wall suction, uh, in that case, it's acting just like a one-way valve, like a Heimlich valve, so there's no active suction. So even with a chest drain system, you can just put it on water seal if that's all that's needed. Um, and then when you do attach it to wall suction, you just set the desired maximum negative pressure with the regulator. Again, we usually set the wall suction to at least minus 80 millimeters of mercury. Now notice that wall suction, for whatever reason, historically is always uh, uh, regulated in millimeters of mercury, whereas the chest drain systems are always in centimeters of water. So it's just the way things historically evolved. So for the wall suction, we wanted it at least minus 80 millimeters of mercury, and then you set the regulator on the chest drain system. Uh, when you transport a patient from the interventional suite to the, the hospital bed, you can either do it on water seal if it's a small air leak, or you can even use a portable suction device that can be uh, requested and, and transported with the patient. And then, of course, you enter your post-procedure orders, specifying how much suction. Uh, and, uh, and then uh, we have an IR chest drain order set for pleural catheters. Uh, of course, do your physician-to-physician -physician handoff. Uh, the patient does have to be admitted to the hospital if you're using an OASIS uh, or a chest drain system. 
And uh, we do occasionally discharge patients with very small air leaks if we're just using a pneumostat or a Heimlich valve. But it's usually if the pneumothorax is sort of persistent and not uh, uh, healing uh, or sealing off right away because it, it's, it's usually the, the majority of cases uh, from a lung biopsy that the air leak closes by the morning. And so you pull the catheter in the morning and then the patient goes home uh, and they don't have to come back to the hospital. But uh, that's, that's sort of uh, uh, depends on clinical circumstances. So there are situations where we send patients home with a pneumostat. Follow-up chest x-rays. Uh, if, if you're concerned that there's a large air leak and you're not sure about the, uh, the wall suction settings, uh, you know, get a chest x-ray later the same day or when the patient returns to the ward and see what it's looking like. Uh, discuss it with the uh, inpatient team if they're going to be involved in management also. Uh, you can no longer order daily chest x-rays. Uh, they have to be ordered each day. And uh, portable films are usually okay. Uh, a PA upright is kind of ideal, especially uh, if you're doing the final management before discharge. Uh, you usually don't need a PA in lateral unless you're trying to assess catheter position uh, and possible dislodgement. Uh, some other post-procedural tasks, of course, you're going to dictate the procedure. Uh, if, if you put the chest tube in while the patient was still on the table for a lung biopsy, the CT table, then it's actually included in the lung biopsy CPT code. So it's just part of the lung biopsy procedure and it should be part of that dictation. If the patient is brought back to the suite from uh, the recovery room or from the hospital bed, then it's a separate procedure and a separate dictation. Uh, let our PAs know about the case so that they know that they will be rounding on the patient uh, with us to monitor the catheter. Um, we manage our own catheters, although for patients who are on the thoracic surgery service, it's kind of a joint uh, management process. Um, we date round daily on these patients. Uh, you want to check the chest x-ray, uh, confirm that the catheter is functioning properly, record catheter output, uh, assess the need for wall suction and uh, uh, pressure settings or water seal, uh, look for persistent air leaks, and uh, if, you, if there's no air leak and the catheter is ready to be removed, we'll talk about the clamping trial. And, uh, and then communication is critical, you know, make sure our team, you know, you do your handoff so that the, uh, the team that's coming on for the weekend or for the, the night, night call is aware of the case. And um, when you do a clamping trial, make sure you also communicate with the floor nurse so that she knows and even, even let the patient know about clamping trials and what to look for in terms of developing shortness of breath uh, or, or chest pain. So when you're checking for an air leak, uh, assuming that the pneumothorax had time to be fully evacuated, uh, if, you, if the patient coughs and the rubber sleeve of a Heimlich valve flutters, that means there's an air leak unless there's a, uh, a leaky connection somewhere. Uh, you can also place the end of a Heimlich valve in a container of water, and if it bubbles, that, that suggests an air leak. If you have a pneumostat device, just hold it upright, put one mil of water in the reservoir, and again, if you see bubbling, that means air is coming out of the chest. If you're using the chest drainage system, bubbling of air in the water seal chamber means there's an air leak. Uh, keep in mind the source can be the lung, the pleural catheter, the tubing, any of the connections, or the OASIS device itself. Um, if you do the clamping of the hose and it's, you still see bubbling, then the leak is located somewhere between where you clamp the hose and the OASIS device. Um, if there's no bubbling, then the leak is somewhere between the clamp and the lung. That's one way to kind of help track it down. Um, when the oasis is connected to wall suction, if there is no bubbling in the air leak chamber, uh, just confirm that, the, that the, there's no line occlusion. And the way you do that is you just turn off wall suction and look at the float ball. It should move up and down with breathing because uh, it should track the pleural pressure. Uh, and if there's, still, if there's still no bubbling, no air leak, and the, the float ball moves up and down, then there's no air leak and it's time for a, um, a clamping trial. If, uh, if you're using the uh, Oasis on water seal, again, just look for the uh, excursion of the float ball. 
and you can have the patient cough or take deep breaths to exclude bubbling that would indicate an air leak. Um, remember to exclude non-thoracic sources of an air leak uh, if you're uh, puzzled by a persistent air leak. Um, okay, so obtain a chest x-ray. Uh, if there's no significant pneumothorax and there's no air leak, you're ready for the clamping trial. Uh, so you can close the stopcock if you use the stopcock the way I showed you, or you can clamp the hose for a couple hours. Again, notify the nurse and the patient of what you're doing, and then repeat the chest x-ray to confirm no recurrent pneumothorax. And then uh, if there is no pneumothorax, you can remove the catheter and uh, get a final chest x-ray before discharge. Um, Okay, if there is an air leak present, uh, generally we wanna leave the uh, tube in place on either water seal or the lowest necessary suction and recheck the next day. Again, try to have the patient position to favor pleural apposition at the puncture site. And uh, when you are ready to remove the catheter, prepare a Vaseline impregnated gauze along with a small dry gauze and tegaderm dressing. You can either unlock the hub to release the loop catheter or cut the catheter, but be sure to first kink the catheter closer to the skin so that you don't inadvertently let air into the pleural cavity. When you're ready to remove the catheter, the dressing is ready. Remove the catheter very quickly, either during expiration, uh, so that kind of creates positive pressure in the pleural space, or you can also do it during a deep inspiration breath hold so if the patient takes in a super deep inspiration breath hold, they can't take in another inspiration during catheter removal. So in other words, they shouldn't be able to generate a negative pressure if they're, if they're already are in deep inspiration. So that's another option. And then just quickly pull out the catheter. And then I like to just immediately rub the, the catheter site to kind of help seal the track and then apply the uh, dressing. Okay, so that's a quick uh, tutorial on chest tube insertions and catheter management uh, for pneumothorax or pleural effusion. I hope this was helpful. If you have any questions, you can always reach out to me. Thank you.